Starlink's competitor lifts off the ground, another Russian spacecraft leaks on the ISS, and oh my god, these asteroid samples are full of carbon and water! I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 13th of October, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. This week, we had a coolant leak on the International Space Station yet again. The leak occurred on October 9th at around 1800 UTC when controllers at NASA's Johnson Space Center observed flakes of material coming out of one of the radiators of Russia's Naoka module. Soon after, the crew also confirmed that they were seeing the same thing through the windows of the cupola module just a few dozen meters away from it. The leaking radiator in question isn't even Naoko's main radiator. It's a backup one that was launched back in 2010 on the STS-132 mission along with the Rosviet module. The intention back then was to install it on Naoka a few years later once it launched, but it ended up taking until 2021 for that to happen. So it wasn't even until May of this year that the radiator was finally installed on the module. Now luckily, this coolant leak won't affect the lives of any of those on board the station, and the crew also wasn't in any danger while the leak happened. The only issue now is that the Naoka module could face the possibility of not being able to run to its full capacity. Moreover, this leak happened less than a year after two other leaks happened on the radiators of Soyuz MS-22 and Progress MS-21. The one on Soyuz MS-22 rendered the spacecraft unusable as a return vehicle and therefore led to the launch of Soyuz MS-23 without any people on it to serve as the replacement spacecraft. This also adds to the much longer string of issues with the Russian spaceflight sector, like the still ongoing leak of air from the Zvezda module on the ISS, the hole found in the hull of the orbital module of the Soyuz MS-9 spacecraft, and the in-flight abort of the Soyuz MS-10 mission due to bad quality control on the Soyuz rocket. This week marks five years since that event. So yes, another leak, another issue, another problem. Whether this is a sign of something more profound, only time will tell, but it's definitely troubling to see all of these events happening so close together in time. In fact, this issue in particular has already delayed two upcoming US spacewalks that were going to happen in the next couple of weeks. They were set to happen on October 12th and October 20th, followed by a Russian spacewalk on October 25th, but the US spacewalks have now been rescheduled to October 19th and 30th. Meanwhile, the Russian spacewalk is now possibly being replanned to repair the leak on this radiator, but no firm plans are in place just yet. Now let's take a look at this week in launches. Another Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 took off this week from Spaceport America with the flight of Galactic 04. Takeoff of VSS Unity under the center wing of the VMS Eve mothership occurred at 1528 UTC on October 6th, with release happening 42 minutes later. On board were passengers Ron Rossano, Trevor Beatty, and Namira Saleem, who also became the first person from Pakistan to fly into space. Along with the passengers was Virgin Galactic's chief astronaut instructor, Beth Moses, who was flying for a sixth time. Piloting Unity were Kelly Latimer, who was flying for a second time, and Frederick Sturkow, who was flying for a sixth time on Unity and his tenth time into space overall. Unity fired its hybrid motor for the nominal burn time of roughly one minute and coasted to an apogee of about 87 kilometers. Touchdown on the Spaceport America runway occurred just 13 minutes after release at 1623 UTC. Congratulations for another successful flight, and we hope to see Unity fly again next month. This week we also had Ariane Space's Vega rocket taking flight again on October 9th at 136 UTC from the Guiana Space Center. It was carrying two main payloads, Triton and Theos-2, as well as another 10 CubeSats as rideshares, all to sun-synchronous orbit. The Triton spacecraft is a Taiwanese spacecraft dedicated to the collection of atmospheric data for weather prediction and for ionosphere, climate, and gravity research. The other main payload, Theos-2, is Thailand's latest Earth observation satellite in the optical spectrum with an image resolution of 0.5 meters per pixel. For a full rundown on these two main payloads and on all the CubeSat rideshares, check out the news story on our website by NSF's writer William Graham through our link and in the description below. A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket lifted off this week on October 9th at 7.43 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East in California. It was carrying a batch of 21 Starlink V2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit. 
The booster for this mission, B-1063, was flying for a 14th time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. With this mission, SpaceX has now launched a total of 5,222 Starlink satellites, of which 359 have re-entered and 4,265 are now in operational orbit. This week, we also had the launch of an Atlas V with the first two prototype satellites of Amazon's Kuiper Internet Constellation. Liftoff occurred on October 6th at 1806 UTC from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral in Florida. The launch was notable because of the unusual secrecy surrounding the payloads for the mission. While most ULA launches for commercial customers involve in-depth coverage and thorough communication of most of the parameters of the flight, things like the timeline and whatnot, this mission looked a lot more like a classified mission than a commercial one. For starters, the launch window for the mission wasn't known until only a few days prior. The launch timeline was also only published for the booster part of the ascent to orbit, and ULA didn't show any coverage of the flight after stage separation. What's more, we don't even have pictures of these satellites, only some pictures of the transport crates when they arrived at the Cape. These prototype satellites were each originally going to launch on their own ABL RS-1 rocket. But due to the failure of the first flight of that rocket last year, Amazon decided to move the satellites to the first flight of ULA's Vulcan rocket. But with the ongoing delays of Vulcan, Amazon took one of the flights that it had already purchased with ULA on Atlas V to fly these two prototype satellites. So that's the long story of why this particular launch. But why the secrecy? Well, while there's no clear answer to this, it is in stark contrast to its direct competitor, Starlink, which not only regularly shows its satellite launches, but also gives a lot of details about when they're being launched, where they're being launched from, and how they're being launched. This is also similar with OneWeb, which, even though it's not a direct competitor, is also in the business of satellite constellations in low Earth orbit and is also very open about these kinds of activities. So one has to wonder what Amazon is trying to hide with all this secrecy. But we'll just have to wait and see what happens. So coming up next for Kuiper, it should be the launch of the first operational batch of satellites sometime in spring of next year on another Atlas V rocket. But let's hope that by then, there won't be much of a secret anymore. This week, we also had the launch of PLD Space's Miura-1 rocket from Spain. While not an orbital rocket, this marked the first time a privately developed rocket capable of reaching space has launched from Spain. What's more, this adds one more company to the growing list of promising European companies trying to develop homegrown rockets. The rocket successfully lifted off on October 7th at 19 minutes past midnight UTC, igniting its main engine for a duration of approximately 100 seconds and reaching an apogee of about 47 kilometers. The company had previously intended to run the engine for 120 seconds and launch to 80 kilometers, but changed the trajectory and burn time closer to liftoff to mitigate the affected areas in case of launch vehicle failure. PLD Space says that the rocket performed successfully during ascent and achieved microgravity conditions during its coast phase. The rocket is a suborbital demonstrator intended to test the technologies for the company's much larger Miura 5 orbital rocket, which is set to launch in 2025 from French Guiana. This larger rocket will have a reusable first stage and is planned to return back down to the ocean under a parachute. As a result, the smaller Miura 1 rocket also attempted this during its flight. Re-entry and parachute deployment happened nominally, but the rocket impacted the ocean sideways instead of head first as it was intended. So this likely broke the fuselage, causing it to sink, and unfortunately, despite recovery teams spending over eight hours searching for it, the rocket was not recovered. But despite all of this, the company considered the first flight of its first rocket a resounding success and is now going through all of its data. Prior to this first flight, the plan was to launch a second Miura 1 rocket before jumping right into the larger Miura 5 rocket, but these plans can always change. And just so you know, PLD, our own Alex says he's ready to visit you guys again whenever you want, so you know how to contact us. This week, NASA unveiled the samples that OSIRIS-REx returned to Earth just a few weeks ago. Now there's lots to unpack from this, so let's first start off with what happened when they opened the canister. Basically, the first thing that they found was that there was a lot of bonus material that had overflowed outside of the collector. This slowed down the operations to open up the collector and retrieve the main samples, but what a problem to have. So over the last couple of weeks, teams working on opening the sample canister had to carefully remove all of this bonus material, as NASA calls it. 
The material was quickly studied with instruments such as electron microscopes and other techniques like X-ray diffraction. And what this quick study showed is that the material is abundant in water in the form of hydrated clay minerals that also contain carbon. It's also been estimated from the quick study that this material is at least 5% carbon in weight. This discovery shows that carbon compounds and water are perhaps more abundant on asteroids than what we previously thought. This could also explain how carbon compounds and water may have also been present on Earth during its initial phases of formation, allowing for the beginning of life shortly after the planet cooled down. It also bodes well for the possibility of finding life in other places, though perhaps maybe not directly on asteroids. But hey, if this happened on an early Earth, it might have been possible in other places too. This is also really good news for future asteroid miners out there, as these elements would be crucial to sustain potential colonies in space, or the manufacturing of materials and refining of rocket propellant. And I know, I know, this is way far out in the future, but hey, we can dream, right? This quick look at these samples shows how valuable sample return missions are, as we can quickly put them through a myriad of instruments and sensors and learn a ton. But not all of it is going to be studied now. About 70% of the sample material will actually be stored for future generations to study. Other pieces of the material will also go to NASA's partners on the mission, JAXA and CSA, who will also study the samples on their own. Three pieces will also be going on display in the next few months at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., at the University of Arizona in Tucson, and at the Johnson Space Center in Houston for the public to visit and see with their own eyes. After all, this isn't just about science, it's also about inspiration. So hopefully we're going to get to learn a lot more from this amazing mission as teams continue to study the samples from asteroid Bennu. And now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. This week, Stoke Space unveiled big plans for its recently named Nova rocket. These plans might sound familiar. A fully and rapidly reusable rocket capable of on-orbit propellant refilling with a second stage capable of going all the way to the surface of the moon or returning back from orbit after deploying a satellite. Yeah, if you're thinking about Starship right now, well, make some room for Stokes Nova rocket. These are definitely big plans, but with a much smaller rocket than Starship, there's a possibility that this smaller company could pull off their goals. And hey, the more the merrier. We certainly need a lot more people working on cool stuff like this. SpaceX's Starlink has debuted a new website unveiling its direct-to-sell product for businesses who may be interested in it. With this capability, Starlink satellites will be able to directly communicate to cell phones without needing any special additional hardware. The company is set to launch Starlink satellites with this capability on Falcon 9 rockets very soon, possibly even as early as December, followed by further launches of these on Starship rockets later down the line. Starlink also claims to be able to support text message communication by next year, with voice and data communication coming up in 2025. India's new crew capsule Gaganyaan is inching closer to its first in-flight abort test. This week, ISRO unveiled pictures of the ongoing preparations of the Gaganyaan crew module that will fly on that test flight. The module, while not fully capable of supporting crew, has the exact shape and weight distribution as the final product in order to more accurately test the forces on it in the event of an abort during flight. The test is currently scheduled for no earlier than October 21st and will pave the way for the first uncrewed test flight of the Gaganyaan capsule next year. This week, NASA has announced the flight schedule for the upcoming commercial crew flights to the ISS. According to this new flight schedule, the next crew rotation mission to the ISS should be SpaceX's Crew 8, which should happen in the middle of February. This would then be followed by the first crewed flight of Boeing Starliner spacecraft in the middle of April. That mission will only be a short eight-day flight to the station, so there won't be a crew handover. After that, in the middle of August of next year, SpaceX's Crew-9 mission will launch, and Crew-8 will hand over the station to them. With this new schedule, Boeing's first rotation mission to the ISS won't happen until 2025, and as of right now, it's not clear if it'll be the one right after SpaceX's Crew-9 mission, or if it'll be much further down the line. Relativity Space's Terran R rocket added a bunch more flights to its manifest this week. Intelsat has signed a multi-launch agreement to launch several Intelsat satellites on Terran-R over multiple years starting in 2026. 
It remains unclear which satellites these will be, but there are indications that Intelsat may be planning a constellation of satellites in medium Earth orbit for the second half of this decade. With this contract, Terranar adds yet another batch of launches to its growing manifest, which Relativity claims totals to $1.8 billion in backlog. Quite a number. Astrobotic has resumed flights of Zodiac, a lander previously owned by Mastin Space Systems. Mastin filed for bankruptcy last year, but Astrobotic quickly bought the assets a few months later, now effectively owning all of its hardware. Thanks to this, Mastin's lunar lander prototypes, such as Zodiac, are continuing to fly and be tested. Astrobotic says that it has completed four test flights of Zodiac from Mojave in California, testing interactions between the plume of exhaust and the surface, research aimed at gathering more data for future lunar landing missions. And now let's see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. This week we were expecting the launch of NASA's Psyche spacecraft on a Falcon Heavy rocket, but it was delayed to Friday, today, due to weather. So that means that by the time you're watching this, it's probably already been launched, but if it hasn't yet, you'll have another opportunity coming up to catch it, as this mission has daily windows every day until October 25th. A delay to October 14th would mean a launch at 1424 UTC. SpaceX also has another launch this Friday, a Starlink launch, which is dependent on Psyche launching as it is a priority. So if Psyche has launched, then get ready because that Starlink mission is set for October 13th within a 4 hour 32 minute window that opens at 2229 UTC. If Psyche delays, the next window for that Starlink launch will be the next day at 2209 UTC. Heads up! Coming up this week we'll have an annular solar eclipse over North and South America. The eclipse will be happening on October 14th, but it's not going to be a total one, so there's not a path of totality, but there is a path of maximum eclipse, aka where the sun will be covered the most. The path will start in the northwest of the United States, in the state of Oregon, and then it'll head southeast to South Texas. It'll then cross the Gulf, pass through the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, and then cross through most of Central America. It'll then jump to Colombia, and then end in Brazil. So if you're along that path, you definitely don't want to miss it, but remember to do it safely. Never look directly at the sun without proper eye protection. Oh, hey, and by the way, you know how that path goes near Starbase in Texas? Well, we will, of course, be covering the eclipse live as it happens, so you know where to find us for that. Next week, we'll also have the launch of a Chongzheng 2D rocket carrying a yet unknown payload, although it's very likely to be another launch of Yaogon satellites given the recent trend. Liftoff is set to occur from the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center within a 30 minute window that opens on October 15th at 1246 UTC. SpaceX is also set to launch another Falcon 9 next week with another batch of Starlink satellites on October 17th within a 4 hour 31 minute window that opens at 2049 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.